Hi, and welcome to a completely optional video where I just feel like chatting about some of the reasons why uh, some of our calculus formulas that we've been cramming down your throat in our previous videos are actually true. So I've just ambitiously titled this my guide to life's unanswered questions, but the truth is I'll probably only focus on questions one and two and five. Answers to question six will just sort of be self-evident. And in fact, the order that we're actually going to do this in, we're actually going to answer question one last. Why is the derivative of an exponential function, a to the x, this really cool formula? The way we're actually going to answer this one last is we're really going to focus on e to the x, and we're really going to do this kind of visually. Um, I think I said I was going to do that one last, but actually what I meant is we're going to do this one first. And so I think because I keep mixing up things, right? I said we're going to do that last, and I meant to say we're doing it first. I think we just answered question seven. So we're going to do question one visually, but then that's going to let us do question two um, using calculus. And then uh, question five will also be able to do using calculus. So there are no poppers in this video. There is nothing in this video that you absolutely need to know in order to do well grade-wise in this class. Okay, well, let's just have some fun talking about some calculus. Let's start with a discussion of one of the best functions ever invented, and we're going to start with not just any exponential function, but the natural exponential function, e to the x. And here's a sort of rough summary of what's going on with this, this great thing. Really, of course, it's based on this natural number e, which is two point blah, 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 blah. OK. Um, and what is actually going on here? It turns out this number e has lots of definitions. There are lots of formulas for, um, that get you this number e. Let me just mention a couple of them. One of them is it'll be actually a limit formula. It'll be the limit as, let's say, n goes to infinity of, uh, oh, I don't know, um, 1 plus 1 over n all to the nth power. Now that looks like a weird thing for me to take a limit of. Right, um, But it turns out this exact limit pops up very naturally when you want to think about earning money in your bank account when, how, and how it's accruing interest. Um, if you just want to think about this as a sort of numerical experiment, right? this would be the limit. Let's see, when n equals 1, we would have 1 plus 1 to the first power. And then when n equals 2, we'd have 1 plus a half. So three halves, but then we're squaring it. And then when n equals um, three, we'd have one plus a third. So that would be what, four thirds? But that would be cubed. And so here's what's happening. The numbers that we're multiplying, right? They're getting closer and closer to one. It's going two, three halves, four thirds, and then the next one would be five fourths. They get closer and closer to one but we keep multiplying them more and more times. So this is a limit that does pop up very naturally in finance. It gives you the number e, um, but it's also sort of a weird race of a limit, right? We have a bunch of numbers trying to go to one, but you keep multiplying more of them together. And so it's not clear how this works in the limit. You get this weird number. That's one definition of e. Here is another definition of e you can say e is 1 plus 1, okay, that's helpful, plus 1 over 2, plus 1 over 6, plus 1 over 24, plus, I'm probably going to get this, this uh, next one wrong, so let me get the, the formula right. 
um, sorry, yeah, 1 over 20, 1 over 120. And there's a pattern to this. You're adding 1 over what's called factorial, a number factorial. I'll let you look up what factorial means. Um, and this is, again, a kind of weird way to define a number as a limit of adding up a bunch of weird expressions, but it turns out this is also a kind of useful thing to do in weird situations. All right, I'll give you one more definition for the number e. If you make a certain graph, so this would be the, uh, a graph of the function 1 over x, this is called a hyperbola, and if I look at when x equals 1, and I'm going to look at the area trapped under this hyperbola, starting at x equals 1, and I'm going to stop it at some mystery number so that this area under this special curve, this um, hyperbola, I want that area to be 1. Well, it turns out the number you have to stop at is the number e. It's a little bit past 2 and a little bit before 3. The ancient Greeks thought about E, or struggled to think about E, I should say, in this last way. They cared about shapes that uh, you learned about, excuse me, in um, your pre-calc course here at U of H called conic sections. So they cared about ellipses and circles and uh, parabolas and hyperbolas. And they had lots of formulas relating to the lengths and areas of all these things, but they really struggled to capture the area underneath a hyperbola. And so they, they really wanted to know, hey, how do I get the area to be 1? What magic number do I stop at? And it turns out to be E. Okay, why do I mention all of this? Well, it is a little unmotivated. If you go look at any calc book, including ours and our notes, the definition of E to the X, it just says, well, E is the natural base. It's 2 point blah, 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 blah. And they, we give you no indication as to why anybody should have ever cared about E. It turns out all three of these definitions can be used to show, um, I should say, any three, any of these three definitions or formulas can be used to show, um, can be used to argue that when we form this exponential function with base e, that the derivative of this thing is itself. And so you can actually find lots of discussions and maybe other YouTube videos on why this is true, on why the derivative of e to the x using one of these definitions for e um, actually equals e to the x. So I'm going to let you guys go think about that, or better yet, you can put that quest on hold and say, maybe I'll think about that after I take calc 2 or calc 3. Um, uh, uh, and maybe I'll, 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 my mind, I'll let my mind drift back to these topics. But what I'd like to show you right now is a sort of visual explanation um, a visual explanation of why if you have a function f of x that equals its own derivative, why, if this happens, this should force f of x to look like some kind of exponential function. That's what I'd like to address first off. This is my answer to my first unanswered question. So to do this, let me just hand draw some axes here. And so you've put in enough hard work this semester to really get something out of this. What we want to do is try and draw a graph of a function, f of x, and here's what we know about it. It equals its own derivative at every input x. The game we want to play is, what would this guy's graph have to look like? And the first thing I'll say is, well, sort of case one, what if f is zero at some point? You could even say, what if f of 0 is 0? So when you plug in the point x equals 0, this graph passes there. Well, then that would tell us 
the derivative is zero there. So the tangent line to this unknown graph is zero. I don't know why that just erased. Okay, thanks, Corona. Um, the tan <laughs> it keeps erasing, dear God. Um, the tangent line is zero there. Maybe I'll graph this in pink. I don't like that. The tangent line is zero though, so the function's kind of flat there. What you can actually argue is that if the first derivative is zero there, well, then the second derivative is zero, and the third derivative is zero, and the fourth derivative is zero, and this observation actually leads you to guess that maybe this function is so flat and paused at zero, maybe it has to be zero. Right, the constant function y equals zero. And certainly you can check that the constant function y equals zero satisfies f prime equals f. So this is a kind of uninteresting case. So let's try a different case. What if, let's say f of zero is positive? Let's just sort of try to intuitively understand this. So that would mean the value is maybe up here. Well, if f of zero is positive, then its first derivative there equals that same number, and so the first derivative is positive, and so the tangent line is positive. Maybe something like that. But not only that, not only is the tangent line positive, um, the second derivative is positive there. So like, we'd have to say something that, oh, it kind of seems like this function would have to be um, concave up at this point. So it'd have to be kind of some kind of smile with this kind of tangent line, so it's got to be kind of curved like that. Right, and you start to think about it, and you say, okay, if, if this is what the graph of this function has to look like, well, then it's increasing right around the point zero, and so a little bit past zero, it's at an even higher value, maybe over here, try and keep the colors the same, maybe it's eventually at this point, and so the tangent line there has to be even steeper because it's at a higher y value. So the function has to be, once you're positive at a point, this magical function has to keep getting more and more steep and positive and stay concave up and so its graph has to look something like this. Similarly, I'll just sort of sketch the third case. If your function starts off negative, then our, our discussion is going to say, okay, we're like this, we're somewhere down there, we're pretty negatively steeped there, which means our function's decreasing, and so it's got to be going down and frowning, so it's going to look like this. So you start to sketch what are the possible graphs that could have this property. The function is its own derivative, right? And if you really think about what I've written there off to the side in uh, black quote-unquote ink, what I've been using is if f of x equals f prime of x, then f double prime of x equals, okay, I took a derivative of this thing, and that equals taking a derivative of this, equals f prime of x, equals f of x. So its second derivative is itself too, right? So if f is positive, it has a positive slope tangent line, and it's like concave up. And so we start to see there are very few options for what the graphs can look like. For example, is it possible that I have an f prime uh, an f of x function that's positive, and maybe it kind of like increases like this, but then maybe it like turns around, is that possible? Well, if it turns around, at some point, the derivatives would be negative. But the value, the y value there, the value of f is positive, and that can't happen because f is supposed to equal f prime. So you can't turn around. You gotta keep getting steeper and steeper like we talked about. And so you start to say, okay, it looks like if a function's gonna have this property of being its own derivative, 
it's got to look like these purple curves I started to draw or this flat line. And if you start to think about all the functions you've come across in your math life so far, exponential functions are exactly the type of functions that look like this. But wait, there's an exponential function we always told you to ignore, right? We always said, so like the exponential functions down here are when a is um, less than one, but positive. And the ones up here are when a is bigger than one. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but, uh, so it's not that any exponential function here will do. This this y equals zero exponential function, if you want, you can think about as quote unquote zero to the x. Now don't think about that if x is negative, but for positive x's, yeah, that gives you that flat line. So when you start sketching what these graphs can look like, they have the property of an exponential function, but not any exponential function. Let me give you an example of an exponential function that doesn't satisfy this, and that would be the exponential function one to the x. The exponential function one to the x is just the constant function one. It doesn't bend up like a lot of our other exponential functions. So it turns out mathematicians sort of argued this point that if a function is its own derivative, it's got to be like an exponential function, but not like any exponential function. It can only be a special one. And so mathematicians sat out to figure out, we are going to say this, based on that visualizing intuition, we're going to say, if f prime of x equals f of x. If we have a magical function that satisfies this, and let's assume it's not the constant zero function, then we should sort of argue that it's got to be some kind of exponential function. And mathematicians went about sort of guessing and checking what could the base be. And we could say, well, a can't be 1, because that doesn't have the right properties. They also were able to argue, like, a can't be 2, and it can't be 3. But they were able to argue that there is one magic number between 2 and 3 that makes this work. And that magic number is what we call E. It is true, if I sort of scroll back up, functions that are their own derivatives have to look like these purple graphs. And you say, well, those kind, some of those kind of look like exponential functions. It turns out there is one exponential function it looks like. And in fact, all other functions, um, functions that satisfy f prime of x equals f of x, they all look basically like e to the x. All other functions that satisfy this are of the form some constant times e to the x. These are all the functions that look like these purple graphs. And they all kind of look like exponentials. They're exponentials that have been stretched by this constant number c. So when c is 0, you get the flat y equals 0 graph. When c is 1, you get e to the x. When c is 7, you get 7 times e to the x, you get a whole bunch of functions whose derivatives are themselves. So I want to be clear, this is, where, this is what I'm going to call an answer to this first unanswered question. Why is the derivative of e to the x um, itself? And I want to be clear, this isn't a rigorous answer. Basically, my answer said, well, 
if you think visually, the functions have to look like some kind of exponential. And then to avoid getting into the details, there is a magic choice for the base that tells you which exponential makes this derivative formula true. And that's as much of an explanation, excuse me, as I'd like to give, but okay. Let's move on to one of our other unanswered questions. One of our other unanswered questions is something like this. Why is the derivative of log base a of x equal to one over natural log of a times one over x? And the first thing I'm gonna do is actually try to answer this for just the natural log of x. Oh, sorry, let me put some notation there. Okay. So I first want to do this for the natural, yeah, the natural log. So I want to ask why is the derivative of the natural log of x equal to one over x? Once we get this answer, then we can answer the original blue question. Well, close to it. Um, okay, so let's at least answer this one. Um, and so here's the deal. We actually already know how to answer this. I already know that the natural log is an inverse for e to the x. So when I compose these two functions, they completely undo each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this composition. I'm going to take a derivative of both sides. Right? I'm looking for the derivative of ln of x. That's going to appear when I differentiate both sides. So what do I get? The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of e, we just discussed, that is its own derivative, so that's e to the natural log x, and then times, by the chain rule, the derivative of natural log x. And that's what I'm looking for. What is the derivative of natural log x? Well, now we almost have a formula for this, right? Because now I have 1 equals, what do I get when I compose e and natural log? Again, they completely undo each other, so this just equals x. And oh my god, look what happens. If I divide everything by x, I just found a formula for the derivative of the natural log function. So what are we doing here? I am now um, saying, OK, if I know the derivative of e to the x is itself, now I can get this formula for the derivative of its inverse. Here's something extra cool that happens. Once I know the derivative of natural log of x, I can now use this to find the derivative for example, of a to the x, right? My actual first question that I said we were going to try to answer was, why is the derivative of a to the x the formula we just told you it was? And I said, well, let's do an argument for e to the x, and now let's talk about natural log x. And now that we have this one, we can now do the derivative of a to the x. So here's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, why is the function a to the x? and I'm gonna take a logarithmic derivative of this. So I'm gonna take the natural log of y, that's gotta equal the natural log of a to the x, and I can bring my x down. And so now I'm going to differentiate both sides. When I take a derivative of natural log of a function, I get one over the function, and I get the derivative on top. And now I'm going to take a derivative of this part. Now, I don't know what the natural log of a is, but it's some constant. So the derivative of x times a constant 
is just that constant. So here's what I have. We'll pick this up over here, make this a terrible visual note. I have that the derivative of y divided by y is the natural log of a. And now I'm going to go and say, okay, but what was y again? Well, y was a to the x, and we were tr trying to take the derivative of a to the x. And so now look what I can do. I can move these pieces around and learn that the derivative of a to the x is exactly the formula natural log of a times a to the x. Okay, so the story so far goes like this. Right, it goes like this. Um, the derivative of e to the x is itself for um, for visual reasons. That was how we sort of argued it. But then this led us to using the chain rule that the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. So we did the chain rule, and we used the fact that they're inverse functions. And then from here, we got that the derivative of a to the x is the natural log of a times a to the x. And really what we did here was we used logarithmic differentiation, right? We really used that the natural log of a to the x, we could bring that power down. And now, we can now, to continue the story, we can now get a formula for the log base a of x. What is its derivative? Or why is its derivative the formula we said it was? Okay, well, to answer this one, I'm going to call this um, function that we're differentiating y. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so what I know, well, I don't have to call it y, but here's what I know. The log base a of x is the inverse for the exponential with a as its base. So I know that this equals x. Let's start this discussion. And so, wait a minute. I know how to differentiate the right side. I know what the derivative of x is, that's just 1. And I know how to differentiate part of the left side. I know how to differentiate a to something that's written right here. So the derivative of a to stuff is just the natural log of a times a to that stuff, and then times the derivative of that stuff. And that's the part I don't know. But everything else in there I know. I have the natural log of a times, now this stuff right here, I'm going to say, oh, those are canceled. That is just um, uh, x, sorry, times my unknown derivative, log base a of x derivative. And so now I can solve for this unknown derivative just by dividing by everything. And I get the formula that we totally told you is true. So this is sort of a crash course. Really what I would like to do is, um, you know, in my version of calculus, I would have spent a slower amount of time on each of these rules. I kind of quickly did them. But they all, once you know one of them, right, once we got e to the x, we were able to get the derivative of natural log x, then a to the x, and then we cleverly got the derivative of log base a of x. So there are reasons for our, all these formulas. I will point out, though, knowing these reasons will help a lot of students feel like this makes more sense, but you still need to practice using these formulas, um, especially for ugly sorts of computations. Okay, and the last question I wanted to try and answer for us was I wanted to think about these inverse trig functions. Inverse trig functions. 
And I always pick on Arc Tangent because it's a great one. Um, so it turns out our derivative rules for inverse sine, right? If I want to take a derivative, it's something like this. And our derivative rule for inverse cosine, we just tell you, of course, and then expect you to start practicing these over and over and over again. Um, but the explanation for the derivative of inverse or arctangent, the way we're going to see why this formula is true, um, the explanation we can totally adjust to see why these first two formulas are true also. So I'm just going to do the inverse tangent one, and I'll let you look up or think about, if you're curious, how this argument would go for the sine and cosine ones. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pretend we have the function um, y of x equals this inverse or arc tangent of x. And what we really want to find is y prime. We want a formula for that if we can find one. Okay, but here's what I'm going to say. If the function y is defined to be the inverse tangent, the arc tangent, then I can rearrange this equation. I can take the tangent of both sides to get a different equation. And the benefit of doing this is I don't really understand what the arc tangent is, except to say it undoes tangent or is undone by tangent. And so when I apply tangent to both sides, it gets rid of it, right? The tangent of arc tangent goes away, and I'm left with x. And now what I can do is differentiate both sides. And you guys, for um, leading up to our second test, we're practicing differentiating equations like this. We're going to have to use implicit differentiation, because I don't really understand the function y of x, so its derivative is going to appear just floating around. So when I differentiate both sides, the derivative of tangent is secant squared of y of x times the derivative of that inside function, y prime of x. And keep in mind, that's what we want. And all of that equals the derivative of x, which is 1. So of course what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this equation to solve for what I want. y prime of x is now equal to 1 over the secant squared of y of x. And if you think about what we're really saying here, secant is already 1 over cosine. So this is 1 over 1 over cosine squared. So if I rearrange that, that's going to be cosine squared of y. And here's where I get a little stuck. I say, OK, sure. I'd really, this is a formula, right, for the derivative of the function y, for the derivative of arctangent. But what I really want to appear on this other side of the equal sign is just x's, right? I want a formula for the derivative of arctangent x just in terms of x's. So I still have a little bit more work to do, right? I'll remind myself here that y was defined to be this inverse fun tangent function of f of x. And so its derivative is the cosine squared of the arc tangent of x. And here's where we can be a little sneaky to get this formula um, to be even simpler than what it appears. It would be actually nice to get a formula, right? What we have here is 
the derivative of arctangent x is the cosine squared of arctangent x. And it would be nice if it would be possible to get the arctangent to disappear from the right side. And there is a cool way to do this. If I kind of think of a right triangle, Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to think of arctangent is really giving me like an angle. I'm really saying x is the tangent of that angle in this right triangle. And so I, if I want to, I can think of that as x over 1, right? And so if this is the right triangle I'm going to draw for this value of x, what I really have here is that um, tangent is, of course, uh, opposite over adjacent. So I could say, oh, opposite, I could make that x, and adjacent is 1. And now I can use the Pythagorean theorem to get that the hypotenuse in this picture is the square root of 1 plus x squared. So I'll, I'll label that here, square root of 1 plus x squared. And now what's the cosine of that angle there that appears? The cosine of that angle should just be adjacent over hypotenuse, which would just be 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. And so the cosine, if I square that, that becomes 1 squared, and I square the square root, it goes away. And so finally, I go back to my blue marker, and I say, oh, that y prime, it's the cosine squared of that arctangent of x. In this picture that helps me understand this, arctangent of x is that angle. And the cosine of that angle is 1 over the square root. When I square it, I get that y prime is just 1 over 1 plus x squared. So we started with, if y is the function arctangent x, math, 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 triangles, math, we found that its derivative can be written with this formula. It's true that the derivative formulas for sine and cosine, for inverse sine and inverse cosine, can be found similarly. All right, that was a little more fun than just working through a bunch of problems, at least for me. Maybe you enjoyed this. I hope you did. Um, if not, that's fine. That's just fine. That's fine. It's fine. It won't hurt my feelings at all. I, I, I'll take it in stride. If you hated this and want to leave like negative comments, you know, I'm an adult. Um, I, I understand that you guys are busy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's no big deal. All right. Have a good one.